I you know what? I think in. you do a pretty good one. So go right ahead. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm uh, Andy, and we've got uh, Vandy, as I like to call him, uh, along with me from Moodle Rooms. She's going to walk you through. Uh, <clears throat> sort of the student and faculty experience in our platform. The platform's called Joule. It's a hosted uh, software as a service approach platform. Um, it's uh, it's some tools and enhancements built on top of the open source product Moodle. Uh, we think it's a uh, fantastic offering. We love it, um, and uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll see uh, a lot of great features and a lot of great benefits in the system today. Uh, more than happy to answer questions as we go through. So if you do have a question, just uh, let us know, and I'll, I'll take a pause when the question comes up, and we can uh, we can address those. Um, I'm not uh, I'm not too strict or uh, rigid on any of that. Uh, I'm going to just begin with a high level sort of look and feel uh, user experience here. I've logged in as a faculty member. I'm logged in as Phil right now. Um, I've got a student logged in as well. We'll take a look at both of those views. Right off the bat, when I've logged into the system, I see a couple of highlights of information. Uh, there's a, a notice here on the front page giving me um, basically a news report uh, or an announcement that was sent out. I actually got a copy of this in my email as well, but it's kind of pasted here permanently on the front page for me to be able to view that. I also have a little pop-up here with a message. This is set up in my profile that if somebody sends me a message where I'm not logged into the system, uh, I want a little pop-up box to show, show me that there's a message the next time I log in. I can chase that into my messages folder I, or I can flag it to ignore it. Likewise, up here in my alerts badge, I have the same information being piped in there. Um, you know, I like to get attention, so it's uh, it's one of those things that I do for myself. This is all configurable in my my profile. I can say I want messages to go to this place when I'm logged in, and I want them to go to this other place when I'm not. Uh, I can also feed all kinds of other system information to different streams and different locations. So here, all down on this page, there's an activity stream showing me a, a set of highlights and data. Uh, because I'm a teacher, I'm getting information about what my students are doing in my course. So I can see that some students are posting in a algebra terms glossary and that they're um, creating some content. And I can see here that someone else, not me, added some content to one of my courses. So maybe I've got another teacher that's sharing this course with me and I get a notice here in my activity stream that lets me know that they updated the course with some additional content. And it gives me a little link here to go visit any of these alerts. Uh, and the activity stream is just a configurable feed. So it's up to me to choose what I want to put in here. Um, and, and then it just gives me a stream of information on the page. If I look at my students view, um, I'm over here logged in as Brandy. From Brandy I've got a very similar set of information. I see there are some updates to the course that have been made over time. Um, I can also come in and see that I've got some grades that have been made. So I got an assignment that was graded in my course. Uh, and this feed just gives me some basic highlights. And again, it's up to me to configure what goes into these different feeds and streams and alerts. I have a lot of control over that behavior, uh, which is great for me because I get picky. Um, <clears throat> For my side, I pretty much fire hosed it all to all of the different places so that I can show it all off. <laughs> uh, if I want to take a look at these messages, I can just jump in through that link to the message center, and I can see threaded conversations I've got with folks. I can see all these different messages that are going on. Um, I've got an awful lot of unread messages in here, <laughs> so uh, I have not been keeping up to date. And I can always start any of these views and see what's going on in those. So I'm just going to pick on this first one uh, out of that lengthy list of messages that are coming in. So I got a notice from this other user in the system. It keeps a nice threaded conversation for me here so that I, it kind of feels a bit like a chat log when I view it in the whole. Maybe if I take a look at Michael, one of my students, I can see the messages in here as well. Um, and in this case, I'm pumping grade change information into my message center uh, through through the settings in my profile. So I can actually keep a record of all of the grade changes that have been going on with the student over time. So there we go. Pretty handy. 
At any time here, I've got access to some quick links and navigation tools here in the theme. I've got a links to the courses that I'm assigned to. I also have a navigation tool that I've pinned over here on my docking bar. The navigation tool, I can move it back to the page or I can move it back up. Same with the settings tool. I can move them both off of there and undock them both with one click and then push them back up. The advantage to docking them is that if I scroll down the screen, like I do down this really long list of unread messages, um, I still have access to those tools at my fingertips, so I can always go back and view them. Here I can take a look at some site level information, I can take a look at my Poro file, or I can see my courses. Using this navigation piece, I can actually view into the courses and see some basic data about the courses, who's enrolled in them, maybe take a look at the reports in the course, but I can also actually open up sections within the course and drill into individual content items. So I could actually navigate from this view directly into, say, this algebra terms piece in my course without actually having to navigate breadcrumb up and down, sideways, click on things. I can just drill straight to the, the item that I want to look at. And here we go. I'm in this glossary. <clears throat> Since I've entered the course, I'm going to hop out and just take a look at the course as a whole. The system <clears throat> is showing me this course. This course is laid out in folder view, which is one of the formats that we've created for Moodle uh, and shared with the community. Folder view is just a way to contain the content in a way that, that we think works really well for courses. I have these expandable, collapsible folders of content. Uh, in the course, I can expand them one at a time, I can expand multiple at a time, or I can expand them all using this little expand all and collapse all function up here. This is a great view for constructing the course, so I can say drag and drop content around or delete content that I want to get rid of. Uh, I can turn on editing since I'm the teacher in this course and I can actually come in and edit the layout of everything. Uh, once I've got everything in the places that I want it to be in, say maybe delete this syllabus, <clears throat> so that I've got another copy of the syllabus up here, <laughs> uh, I, I can turn editing off and then I can start viewing the course in uh, sort of a normal layout. Uh, and by that I would mean probably drilling into a specific section of the course. Once I do that in folder view, I leave behind all the other content except for the content that's in that one specific folder that I'm viewing. It allows me to narrow my focus and just pay attention to the content that is important to me now. I can use a jump list to hop over to other sections that are open in the course. Um, but again, this is just a nice way for me to focus my attention on the content that matters. Um, You'll notice I still have editing on here. I can still come in and update any of these pieces. Uh, I can change the names of these pieces, so I could actually just edit any of these just by clicking on edit here. And then just hit return to finish that edit. I don't have to go through any formal big process to make those changes. And I guess, uh, you know, for the sake of argument here, um, just to show you that it's possible, I've got a syllabus file, the one I just deleted right out of that spot. I can add it right back in uh, just by dragging it off my desktop and adding it into the space. By default, it knows Andy, what it is. Can you hear me, Andy? Yeah, I can. Oh, perfect. Um, can you hang on one second? Something happened to our computer. Hmm. No problem. Oh, hang on. It's it's back. Okay, we're good. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, excellent. We'll uh, we'll just let me know if that comes up again, though. Um, All right. Hopefully not. <laughs> the uh, is there anything you want me to backpedal and show real quickly? Um, I, like, no, I think I think we got it all. I think it was just a really okay. quick thing. It seems like the computer yeah. went to sleep, so I may have to wiggle the mouse occasionally. Ah, that's always fun. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, it's really easy for me to add content and accept default behavior. It knows it was a PDF. It gives me a little PDF icon. If I click on the f this file resource now, it just opens up in an embedded view of the page because that's the default for PDFs. If I want to change that behavior, I can go into the update this file tool here, uh, which is also over here in this, this setting tools here. I can edit the settings, and that would allow me to change the behavior to maybe be 
open up in a pop-up or force download or uh, you know any number of different options that I want to dive into. But uh, I'll be honest, the default is probably always what I want, and I'm done. I don't have to deal with any other funny hoops or bells or whistles. Just drag the file up there, it works. I might ask myself, how does this look to my students? Uh, how does this view appear to them? You know, is this resource going to show up? Uh, I don't have to have a dummy account to do that. I can actually open up my settings toolbox again here on the side and use this switch role to function and click on the student role and I can now see what this course looks like as a student. Uh, it strips out everything that doesn't belong for that view and it applies all of the rules of student role to me now. So you'll notice uh, my editing tool button is gone so I can't get in here and edit the page or any of the content because students can't do that either. Um, and I see exactly what a student would see in this course. Um, I can jump into this resource. I'll see the resource as the student would see it. And again, the editing tools, those update tools are all gone. If I go to my settings toolbox, you'll notice for course administration, I've lost access to all of those funny things that I shouldn't have access to anymore. Uh, my administration tools are much smaller, uh, and here I've got my return back to my normal role function. So I can just click on that and return right back to where I belong and see the course uh, as my normal role. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a really handy feature. It's really easy. I don't have to log out and log back in or do any, any funny tricks uh, or just trust that things are working out. I can actually see that they are. A real common use for that is if I wanted to apply restricted access rules to this resource. So if I wanted to say this file is only available after this date or between these dates or if you've viewed some other content or gotten a grade in something else, uh, any, any sort of version of those rules or compound rules that I want to apply, uh, I can verify that they're working by switching my rule to student real quickly, and see that it does the right behavior, and then I know I'm, I'm done. <clears throat> Here on the page, you might notice there are all these funny little check boxes, empty boxes at the ends of some, some of these lines. That's because these resources have completion tracking turned on for them. Completion tracking is a behavior that's available in the system. Uh, I can configure it to be on any element in the class. I'm going to jump over to my student view and take a look at my courses. You'll notice here again I've got a nice little menu that just shows me what courses I'm in. It pops down out of the, uh, the menu bar there. I can jump to the course that I was interested in taking a look at. And here on the page you'll see I have completion tracking check marks now. So the system is automatically completing me for this content based on the rules set up. One of the options also is for me to be able to just click on this box and self-complete. So I say, oh, I feel like I did that check, now I'm done. Um, for example, here the attendance module, I turned that on that way just to be able to demonstrate that. So as a student, that gives me the ability to go, ah, I feel like I've finished that off uh, attendance module. Probably not the thing I would turn auto or self-completion on in reality, but it, it makes it easy for me to demo. Uh, again, I have the same control of my view here that the faculty member had, so I can dock blocks over to the docking bar, I can pull them down, uh, I can reorganize them however I want to, uh, and I can also open and close all these little folders and I can drill into specific folders. One thing that's nice here is that if I log out and log back into this course, I start with this view of the course again by default. So it takes me back to the view that I was looking at last time. Uh, it, and then that combined with the completion tracking makes it so that I know what things I've done and what things I haven't done. So I don't have to kind of sit here and scratch my head and try to remember what to do next. Uh, it's very straightforward for me. If I had any other questions about completion tracking, you'll notice here I have a little block that's on the page. The faculty member set this up for me and it just shows me my progress against being completed in this course. What's required? I need a grade of 75% or higher, a uh, teacher or this distance learning teacher can check off for me that I'm completed, and I need to complete a total of 13 activities, and so far I've only completed three. Uh, it gives me a really quick, easy metric here. I can drill into that to see more detail. 
the faculty member can actually drill in and see this detail across all of the students. So I get a little grid as a teacher that shows me how everyone's progressing against all of these goals. So it's really easy for me to see how folks are doing and whether or not they're progressing towards finishing. Um, it's, it's just a nice, easy tool. <clears throat> Any questions on those pieces? I think we're good here, Andy. Excellent. Well, thank you. I was actually stealing a drink there <laughs> while I was <laughs> pausing as well. So that was a sort of a, uh, a selfish question asked there. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is a little dry today. I want to just take a look at uh, some of the highlights of features and functions in the system. Um, we're going to take a look at this uh, this forum here, we call it the advanced forums. This is something that we're, um, we've are we contributed to the community. It's just a slight spin on the standard Moodle forums. Some of the enhancements in here um, I'll point out as we go through just as we talk about the general functionality of forums. This is a standard forum. Uh, by standard forum it just means that it displays a pretty straightforward format and it allows students to post uh, original threads and reply to each other and have an honest forum discussion uh, with one another. It's pretty simple, a nice view here. I can see which forum posts or which forum posts are unread for me so I can come in and read them. Um, and then I've also got the ability to do things like bookmark posts. So maybe I want to come back to this one from Brandy. Then I can also mark posts as substantive. This substantive flag is something that I can come back to, a substantive flag is something I can come back to and uh, allow myself to uh, use in grading when I want to grade these students' efforts. I also just wanted to show off really quickly that you know there's that sort of view of the forum, but this advanced forum actually allows me to change my views. Um, if this is something I'm more comfortable with for a view, it's available to me. I can go to, into tree mode and then I can actually expand and see the replies underneath the trees. Um, you know, if this is what I really dig, it's there. If not, I don't have to deal with it. I also have nested, which goes back to where we were before. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we try to give you a lot of options and possibilities. Uh, nested is a nice view in my book. This is kind of my most comfortable view, to be honest. Um, it's kind of the feel that I like, or the default view, which is sort of the standard Moodle view, where I had that nice grid of everything. Um, <clears throat> when I hop in, I'm going to jump in to, to open this up. I can see here that I've got a post and a reply. I can actually do all of your standard for, forum management pieces. I can split it or delete posts as the moderator, uh, but I can also reply. So I'm going to click on reply, and it's going to bring up uh, the basic form interface. The posting and replying use the same view, of course, with a reply. Um, it already knows what the subject should be uh, and allows me to go on from there. I have my standard HTML editor. Um, this is consistent throughout the entire system. I can play with it a little bit here. I can actually pop it out and toggle in full screen. It's got all my sort of expected behaviors in an HTML editor. Uh, I can do all kinds of fonting. I can link. Uh, I can also insert images and multimedia in here. I've got an equation editor that allows me to do drag and drop equation building. Um, and I've got a webcam tool integrated in here. This is an add-on product that we've got available. It's an integration with a, a tool called Kaltura. That's a third-party video repository system. And with that, I now have the ability anywhere this HTML editor shows up to record a video uh, directly into the system uh, at will. So I don't have to jump out, make a video, upload it, save it, you know, plop it in. It just handles all of that in the background for me. Uh, I can create a reply here. Um, I can add files based on the rules inside the forum setup. And then I also have this one other option down here where I can reply privately. I've got these contextual help icons throughout the system. If there's something I don't remember what that means, uh, you know, what, syntax is a little lost on me, it, just click on that little icon and I get a pop-up that tells me what it's it actually it's trying to say. So when I reply privately, it's not visible to other people that I'm responding to this person. And they can't choose to reply to my hidden reply as well. So uh, it's a really good way for me 
with this private reply to give directed feedback to the student without opening that up to everybody else in the class. I'm going to go ahead and abandon that, that post, jump back to the page. <clears throat> The forums have a lot of standard functions. I can do all kinds of classic restrictions in a forum, like students can only reply, but they can't post. Um, I have a question and answer mode where I pose the questions, the students reply to the questions, and you can only read the replies of other students after you've made your reply. So it forces you to answer first, and then you can see what other people said. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of really great features in this discussion forum tool. And the last thing I was going to show tied to this is I'm going to hop over to the grading interface for it. Um, we've created this special interface called the Joule Grader. Joule Grader is um, just a really handy way for me to, to process everything I need to grade in the class. If I click on this button that says show activities requiring grading, um, it's a little bit wordy for a button, but, uh, but it says what it means. Uh, I can see only the things that need to be graded at this point, things that are waiting for a grade. Uh, it, I liken this to back when I would sit at my desk and grade a stack of papers. It's the same experience. Um, I have a stack of responses from the students. I can flip through the students. So I can use this drop down or I can use these next user or previous user buttons to sort of flip through them. And I can also jump to different assignments or forums in the class and grade uh, that way. Uh, and it just gives me an easy view of what the student's work is. I can see that I've bookmarked this post, but I haven't marked anything in here uh, substantive or substantive. It's easy for me to see that right here. I have a digest, so there's one post, no replies. Um, it, it's just straightforward with the metrics and the ability to see. If there's more than one post from the student, I can see them all on this page. You'll notice that I started to give this student a grade, but I haven't saved it yet. And I'm using a rubric here. So I can come in, modify it. Um, I can also type in some directed feedback. Why is it that I'm giving you this, this score on this, this uh, particular criteria? And if I hit Save and Next, I'll jump to the next student in the list. Take a look at the Dropbox as well. I jump over to there. Um, It'll just give me, again, the digest of who has submitted but is waiting on a grade. Uh, I could download all of the files if there were multiple files uploaded. I can download individual files, and I can also, for this PDF, open it up in line. Uh, so I can read the, the document that was submitted and see what they did right here on the page. Uh, upcoming releases over the summer will be releasing the ability to tie in other tools that will allow you to read, say, Word documents or PowerPoints or Excel spreadsheets in the same way, so embedded in page. And again, I can open up the grading tool. In this case, I've got a checklist instead of a rubric. Checklist is just a slightly different approach to the same idea. I've listed off criteria, um, you know, what my expectation is, and I'm in this case, instead of doing the shades of gray of a rubric, I'm just saying, well, did you do it or not? Um, if you did, you get the points. If you didn't, you don't get the points. Uh, and then move on. So it's, a, again, a pretty straightforward and simple way for me to do this. I can do that feedback. I can hit Save and Next, and it will bring up the next person on the next activity for me to grade. So it's actually pretty nice. Um, I do also have one last piece in here, which is a um, the ability to grade with a checklist. Um, this allows me, or I'm sorry, the ability to have this threaded conversation here. Um, I can have a conversation with the student about their work in the context of their work. The student sees the same view in the interface. The only difference is that they don't have the ability to change the grades. Um, so we can have a conversation about their work. I can give them feedback, uh, ask them questions, they can ask me questions, we can have a conversation. It's all tied to the work that we're talking about and it's all private between the two of us in this space. <clears throat> Any questions about this uh, greater interface? It looks like we're fine here. Excellent. Hang on um, one second, hang on one second, we have one. Oh good. Is there a way to ink on any of the documents, or are they static? 
Uh, these particular ones I'm showing are static. If I use, um, for example, a uh, online homework submission, then I can actually turn on inline commenting in that, where I write my comments directly into their submitted document. Uh, that's the easiest way to do that. Uh, and that, that is a pretty handy way to go. And it automatically highlights it in a different color so it's clear that that's what I wrote, not what the student submitted. Uh, all of that behavior, yeah. And as I think that's summer, it here. I just want to add to that a little bit. As he mentioned, for the summer release, we're actually going to be supporting, uh, you know, Microsoft Documents uh, denotations in this as well. So that'll be available this summer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So since we were talking about grades, I'm going to jump to the grade book. Um, everybody's favorite part of every LMS, I'm sure. Um, yeah, <laughs> we uh, we think we've done a good job here, uh, and we hope that you you like it. Um, we're sort of riding the balance between what classic Moodle does and what um, what we hope to achieve. Uh, Moodle's grade book is extremely powerful. It lets me do all kinds of really complex grading schemes, uh, rules about computing grades, adding elements together, dropping the lowest scores, uh, very complex functionality underneath it, including extra credit rules. Um, it's all really robust and fantastic, but it's also uh, quite honestly overwhelming if all I want to really do is just have grades in a grade book and have it total up to 100 points. Um, so what we've tried to do is strike a really good balance between that. I have access to all those really powerful tools if I want them, uh, but they're not up front and center on the page for me all the time now. They're they're hiding back in the settings where they sort of belong. Uh, when I want to use them, they're right there for me. When I don't want to see them, I don't actually ever have to look at them. Here in this view of the gradebook that we've created, um, I start off with my categories in the gradebook. I'm grouping my grades by grade type, homework, quizzes, discussions. Part of why I do that is because I apply different rules to those different types of grade objects, right? I, I use homework, I scale all the homework down because homework totals up to several hundred points every time I teach a class, but I only really want it to count for 20. So I'm using that scaling and I'm also applying drop the lowest rules on it. So I drop the lowest score out of the homework, which gives my students the ability to do poorly once without suffering or skip one if they have to without suffering. Um, and But I'm not applying that rule to all of those scores, I'm just applying it to the homework. Uh, it's really simple for me to build those rules out, apply them on these categories, and now here in this view, I just see the digest of the grade. How, uh, how are these students doing in each of these different categories of grades, and what's the course total grade looking like? Uh, I've added into here a range of grades that's available uh, for each of the categories, and I've added an overall average for each of the categories, so I can see how students are trending. Once I'm done looking at that view, I can then dive into the individual categories of grades and see the graded objects themselves. So these are the things that are contributing to the grades. <clears throat> I can drill into any of them. I can take a look at the scores. I also have the ability to open up um, my action item here. My action widget is available on all of these, and it gives me some pretty, pretty good options for tools. I've got the ability to open up that Jewel Grader interface that I was just in and start grading these students' efforts in here. I can go to the module. Uh, column grader is a nice tool. Typically, I would use this with homework, where I've graded students' work offline, perhaps. I've got a listing of scores that I've generated. Uh, I can come back in the system and start typing in scores and hitting tab to move to the next value. Now, there are other ways to enter scores into the system besides just in this interface, but I'll be honest, this is the easiest way if I have a list of grades to get those grades in the system, just straight out. <clears throat> I can also then choose to make all the empty cells zero. You'll notice it fills in all the ones I didn't with zeros. I can close out my grading for this assignment or this uh, discussion forum really quickly and easily this way. Maybe 
uh, what I'd like to do is let's hop over to the homework. Andy, we, oh, we did you have a question? question? Yes, we have. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm really interested in great brokers. Uh, can multiple people enter grades to uh, the same grading group? For example, we have three instructors and 22 PAs. We have lecture uh, activities, homework online, and we have lab sections that are mixed. Is there a way to create one grade book and then have multiple different people add the grades in? Yes, yeah, we can, and you can control who has access to the grades in the course based on their roles. So maybe you've got teaching assistants that aren't able to edit grades, but they can view grades, um, you know, and, and you can define that by the roles. So you can go in and say this, this type of person can edit grades, this type of person can see other people's grades, this, these people can't see other grades. Um, and you've got full control over that in the system. Meaning that I can enter the uh, um, lecture grade and then all my kids can enter their lab grades? Yeah, exactly. So they can come in and, and enter in. You could create, say, a, an assignment, an offline assignment type that says, you know, lab X for this, this faculty member, lab Y for that one. Uh, and then they can come in and enter the grades accordingly. You could also split the students up into groups in the course, like I've done in my course. Um, and so I can actually filter on particular groups of students, which allows me to then say, well, group A are the students that are in this lab. So I can change my view of the course to just look at those students, and then I can assign them grades without having to weed them out from the whole class. Does that make sense? One more thing, can I upload uh, grades from some, something, another device, let's say uh, Clickos? Yes, I can import and export grades. So I can export the grades in, a, in multiple formats, and then I can import grades back in in either a CSV uh, or Excel format. The Excel format, or the, I'm sorry, Excel, uh, XML format is very Moodle specific. So if you had another Moodle course with grades, you could import them that way, but the CSV file is the way to go for a generic import. And students are identified by some ID number? Exactly, exactly. So you would identify the students by whatever ID number is is common between them. Um, and you, the easiest way to do that is to do an export of the thing you want to upload the grades into. And you can see how the gradebook is calling the students and calling the assignment that you're going to upload the grades into and then just push the grades back in. But I'll be honest too, this, this ability to open the column grader and just type grades in is pretty quick as well. So, you know, if you've got a list of a long list of students, this is going to take a while. So that's where that import really comes in handy. Yeah. Excellent. Anybody else while we've got the microphone on? Okay, we're good. Go ahead and fin go on. Excellent. Uh, some other features built into here, I've got the ability to grab students and message them. I can grab them by grade range or I can grab them by incomplete, so people that don't have a grade yet. Uh, I can modify this message a little bit, knock a couple people off the list, or I can add recipients to the list. Uh, I can type up the message and send it out. It's going to be a private message to each of them, so it's not a like a common group thread that they're going to be all tied into. Um, so it's a personal message for each of them, but it, it's an easy way for me to reach out. Uh, you know, I see that they haven't completed the assignment. I can send them a message warning them that the assignment's due and I want them to turn it in really soon. It's just an easy way for me to take action on that right through the grade book. Likewise with the grade range, it's the same sort of experience. I see people are struggling with their grade. Uh, I can choose a range of grades to grab. Uh, it pulls out the list of people from the gradebook who are in that grade range, and I can send them a message right out of the system. Sort of. Andy, we've got another question here. Yeah. Andy, as we're recording grades or and putting in comments back to the students, uh, do we have the ability to do that audio or video? With the comments inside that Jewel Grader interface, I do have the ability to make a video comment back to them with that Kaltura integration. 
uh, because I've got that webcam tool built into that that interface again. So if I've got the Kaltura plugin turned on, then I can do those video recordings. Yeah, and that tool that it's in the it's just in the HTML editor, so it shows up. You know, the forums. It shows up when I make HTML text on a page. It shows up, for example, when I create a question in the question bank. I could make the question a video. I can make the individual multiple choice responses videos, and I could even make the feedback to those responses videos. Uh, or audio tracks, or whatever I want to do, uh, depending on the tools and the files I want to use. Yeah. Great question. And okay, you can even use it for one. lecture capture if you uh, need to. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's a great little tool. Andy, um, yeah. I have another, another question for you about the the video um, comments. So let's use those comments then would be using a webcam. Um, is there a way to include a screen capture um, as well in with video comments? The webcam itself won't do screen capture, but the the Kaltura tool set allows you to do screen captures. Um, so you would just go into the Kaltura directly uh, through the integration, not use the webcam, but make a Kaltura object and then put that in. Um, it's a slightly different workflow, but using the same two tools, if that makes sense. Hi, I have, a, I have also another question about grading. Um, I was wondering how much of this we can select that the students see, and I'm thinking like sometimes the real... You know, I'm sorry, I lost your audio partway through that. Uh, question? I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, uh, we lost the audio on their end. Yeah. Uh, looks like they're still logged in. Audio is turned on. Oh. There, there they are. Hi, can you hear oh, me now? Okay. Yes, I can. There we go. There okay. we go. Okay, I'll say <laughs> that again. Um, uh, I was wondering how much of this uh, great information can students see, and in particular, you know, if uh, we could, for instance, take well and they can see how many classes they missed, or they can, you know, is there a way to see how many assignments they're missing so far, and things like that. That that is a great question. That's a whole bunch of really good stuff, actually. So so I'll start with grades, uh, and yeah, the the students have this user report view of themselves which I'll show you really quick and I I can change what's visible in this in my settings I've kind of turned on an awful lot of things in here to show what's possible um, frankly it's too many things but if you want to use as many things you certainly can uh, if I choose one of the students in the class like Brandy for example I can see what what her view of the grades would be and in this case I'm turning on you know what's the weighting what's the grade what's the range of grades what's the letter grade and what's the average score so Brandy can see how she's scoring against the average student in the class she can see the feedback if I gave any feedback in there and what what her actual grade is um, this is just a very basic view of, of the grades and I can see in this view you know things that aren't done yet uh, but I'll be honest, this doesn't show me necessarily why I don't have a grade. Um, it just shows me that I don't have a grade yet. Uh, if, if my question is really about uh, where am I at in my classes, what's been done and what hasn't been done, oh, I'm mousing over the wrong window there, sorry. <laughs> um, I could actually use some other tools in the system really easily to get at that information. So I'm going to scroll down here. I thought I'd pinned this up there, but I guess I'd left, I popped it back off. Um, if I use my navigation tool, I can go to my home page here. And my home page is, is really a dashboard for me uh, as a student or a faculty member. And I can see in this view for all of my courses, homework that's due, homework that's due that hasn't been submitted, or homework that's been submitted and graded or not graded. So here, for example, in this algebra, course that we're looking at in this demo, I can see that these two assignments I've submitted and they've both been graded. And these, this assignment I submitted, but it hasn't been graded yet. 
and for this assignment, I can see that I've not submitted it yet, and it hasn't been graded. But you know, the due date's still a little ways out. I'm safe, not for long, but safe. <laughs> so it it does give me uh, a, a really nice digest of all of this information. Um, this page and this view is is a pretty nice little slice uh, or window into my my current state in the system. Does that answer kind of the different pieces of your question? Did you want to know about the attendance block specifically? Oh yeah. Anything anything that you wanted to know specifically about the attendance block arena? So, so can sure. you tell us about the attendance block? I would love to tell you about the attendance block. Uh, the attendance block is actually two pieces. It's a block and a module. Uh, when I'm in there as the faculty member, I set up inside the activity my schedule that I plan on taking attendance on. So I say this is a Monday, Tuesday, Friday class that meets from 2 to 3.15. Um, I set that in there. I say how many weeks I'm going to go for, and it builds out the placeholders uh, essentially like a ledger book for me uh, automatically based on the schedule I gave it. And then I go in and mark attendance in it and my students can see here I can see an overview of attendance. Um, I can see what I've what I'm scoring in attendance so far and then I can actually drill into the view through this block and see you know what scores have been given. So it looks like attendance has not been taken very regularly in this class. But it does give me a view of the attendance. I can zero in on, take a, like a week's view instead of a month's view of it. I can look at everything in the past, which is a nice way for me to sort of take a stab at how have I been doing so far. Um, and it, it's a pretty straightforward and easy system. Uh, from the faculty viewpoint, uh, I've got a, the attendance tool. I've got a link here in the block to go take attendance or look at the attendance reports. I can upload a file with attendance information in it as well. If I've got um, a couple of weeks worth of information that I need to get in there because grades are getting a little outdated. But it's really easy for me to go in and say take attendance directly. So maybe I'll click on an action icon here, go in and, and I get a listing of everyone in my class along with an attendance mode. This is the default setting in here that it creates present, late, excused, or absent, and then the scoring by default is 2, 1, 1, and 0. Uh, it's up to me. I can modify that, of course, but that's, that's just sort of the default behavior. I can click on any of those to assign everyone in the class to that by default, and then I can come in and modify things. Um, and, and make any comments if I wanted to save some extra comments in there and then I can save that attendance score just like that. It's a pretty easy walkthrough for me as a faculty member. So uh, how do you uh, actually record the Do you do it by hand or how do you, is it online? This would be for me to record in the class the physical presence of the student in my physical classroom. If I want to add their their attendance in my class is, say, part of the grade. That would be where this is really driving towards. I've got other ways to take a look at who's been visiting the class online and who's been engaging in the course content. Um, if we want to take a look at that, I've got some other pieces for that as well. Do you have an electronic way of getting attendance in class? Like that you've showed up and now you get a grade for that? Is that where you're? Or to just be able to see that someone has been attending the online portion of the class? One of the things that many of our faculty do, Andy, is use clickers. Um, to take attendance for large, large classes, um, do you integrate okay. with clicker devices? Yes, there are several clicker devices that have got integrations in the system, and a couple of others that are talking to us about getting them and added. Um, like Top Hat Monocle is talking to us about getting their their plugin added in there. Uh, I forget which ones exactly are in there. Um, to be honest, I've seen an awful lot of them. 
uh, over the years. But um, we have a plugins list available on our websites. Uh, it's a public available list. And if I click on, um, for example, here in the footer in my theme, I've got some manuals and knowledge base links. And if I click on those, I'm going to actually jump out to the dashboard here. I've got a link to download the current plugin matrix that tells me every plugin that's available in the system. Uh, yeah, and I'll be honest, I don't remember which ones we've got um, right now, but that list has them all in there. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and that would be a really good way to do electronic attendance then. Sure. <clears throat> I'm going to jump over to, to take a look at reports, uh, unless you've got any other questions around grades and attendance. Looks like Did we're good. OK, good. I heard a little phone being there too, so I wanted to make sure I hadn't lost you in the audio. Um, when I go to the reports dashboard, I start with some basic metrics in a, you know, sort of engagement slice in the class, you know, how are people doing, or, you know, activity in the course, posts to the forums, assignment submissions, quiz submissions, things like that. So it just gives me a view of kind of activity. It's nice, um, you know, but I probably want to look at some real data. And that's where the real reports come in. I can look at activity views and grades. Uh, I can look at each of the, the sort of classic activities specifically and see how their submissions and posting uh, have gone. So quiz submissions, glossary and forums, assignments, scores, wikis, all of those I can see specific slices on them. Roster and recent activity or sort of log style reports. The roster report shows me everyone that's logged into the class. Um, by default, it's the last seven days, and of course, I can always modify that that window to get a slightly different report. Um, needs grading is a handy report that just gives me a listing of everything in the class that needs a grade manually um, and is waiting on me to take action. So, and then I've got a link in here, so I can click on it and go directly to the grade interface and start grading that activity. Uh, I can filter all of these reports on different uh, rules or pieces of information. They change a little bit in context, of course, but really it boils down to you know grade categories, sections of the course, specific activities or activity types. So I could say, well, just show me all quizzes that need grades um, and weed out everything else, and then I can start going in and grading those. Uh, those quizzes need grades because they have manually graded items inside them where I had the students submit an essay that I need to read um, rather than an automatically graded element. Uh, you know, this is a great set of reports. It gives me some good views of what's going on in the class itself, and, and I can see a lot of data about the course. Uh, I, I think the the next obvious question is kind of leading to what about, say, assignment submissions, I might want to know who hasn't submitted an assignment, and that's what these exception reports are all about. So again, I can filter on a specific assignment, get a listing of students, and this shows me everyone who has not turned this assignment in, um, instead of everyone who has turned in this assignment. Uh, in this case, this assignment is due pretty far in the future, so it's not really a problem, but you know, hypothetically, if it was, I could grab a bunch of students out of there, send a message, and be able to draft the message, and just like in the grade book, send each of them an individual message saying, hey, you know, this is coming up due, you need to turn this in, etc." So I have a question about that, Andy. Is that sure. message internal, uh, to the, in, internal to the course website, or does that, can you actually push that message out to email, through email? Uh, Typically, it's going to go out to email. It does depend a bit on the user and how they've set up their profile, but it also depends on the administration and what they allow me to choose. Typically, all messages like that are forced to your email by default, and then you also have the option to add it to other places internal to the system. Um, and that's what I would recommend, to be quite honest. Uh, but yeah, you could set it up so that it always stays inside the box and never leaves if that's really what you wanted, but no, I don't think that's what you would. Yeah, good question. 
<clears throat> uh, I've got uh, you know basically the same lineup of, of reports that I had in the class report available here. Um, the roster report, etc. The roster report in this case shows me people that haven't logged into the system in the last seven days instead of the people that have. Uh, I've got a lot of other reports. Um, Learner view is just really the course reports but focused on one user uh, at a time. This is also the view of reports that students have where they see just themselves. Um, comparison reports allows me to come in and compare different courses or different um, my students across all my courses that I teach them in or all of my courses across the site and I can compare them to sort of see if I've got any sort of engagement or efficacy trends that might matter to me. So I could say, ah, you know, this resource is doing well, this resource is doing poorly, you know, is there something I could learn about each of these resources that matters? Um, it, it gives me a lot of pieces in here. If I was an administrator, I could sort of construct my own report of, you know, what courses I'm going to take a look at um, across the site. Whereas as a faculty member, it's, it's really quite nice because it shows me just the courses that I'm engaged in and how I'm doing across those. And then, of course, for the participants, it gives me just the students that I'm teaching in all of my courses and how they're doing. So it's, it's a nice little piece. Here, what's kind of handy is that I'm, perhaps I'm teaching the same students across multiple terms, and I can see how they did in one term versus the next. So I might say, you know, Bob's not doing all that great here, but he's doing a lot better than he did last time. So maybe I'm doing my job right. Um, yeah, you know, those are pretty standard canned reports that we try to put together that give you some good data. I'm going to hop back to the course. I'm going to just sort of say on a very high level, one thing I'm going to note is that, um, you know, both the grade book and those reports had a lot of really nice ways to take action on items, the things that I see happening, uh, trends that are going on. I can say, ah, you know, I'm going to send out a message to these students or, uh, you know, it, it's great to have that power at my fingertips, uh, but I think that falls short of really what's actually useful in the system because we are talking about computers here this personalized learning designer tool takes all of that to sort of the next level where I create rules um, or borrow rules and use them to drive actions in the system automatically. So instead of going in and seeing who hasn't logged into the class in the last seven days, I can make a rule that checks every three days to see who hasn't logged into class in the last seven days and if they haven't, send them an email uh, automatically on my behalf. So I don't have to go in and look at the report and take that action step. I can just have the system do it for me. Likewise, I can do rules around grades. So, you know, if your students are doing poorly, I can do remediation or if they're doing well, I can congratulate them. Uh, I can allot content. I can change folks, um, uh, pull them out of or add them to groups. Um, and I can trigger all this behavior on course grades, activity grades, um, dates and times, uh, entering the course and viewing content. All of those can, can trigger a check of these conditions and then allow me to take action from there. At a really high level, you know, I think it's a really great tool there and it's got a lot of flexibility. Let's take a look at a specific rule. Um, I can edit this rule and just sort of dive into what's possible. Um, <clears throat> this rule is about retaining students by identifying people that are performing or underperforming and allow me to, um, to take action then. So I'm going to go ahead and build in here. I'm going to add another type of assignment. Um, we have two different classes of them. There's a version change that changed some behavior. So I'm going to add that new type of assignment to the role or, or the check there. Uh, and then I'm going to maybe modify this and say, you know what, 70 is kind of weeding too many students. So I'm going to change that to 65. So now I can edit that. You'll notice it, it highlights that and says, you know, you've edited that, that piece. Make sure to save that change. Uh, and then I can come over here and take a look at the actions. I've got a lot of actions coming out of this one. 
I can unlock content using this release code. So they don't get this code, they don't see the code, it just automatically unlocks any content that has that code assigned to it in the, the, the adaptive release mode. Uh, just like dates and grades could be used as well. Uh, I can display an alert, which is a pop-up on the screen, just like that little message that tells me I've got messages in my, my message queue. Um, I can type in text in here and I can also insert tokens. I don't have to know the code for the token, I can just add little pieces in here. So I can say, um, <clears throat> add a grade here to this, this message for the student. And you know, say I see you're struggling with this concept and got a grade. And add that, that grade information to this message now. Uh, likewise, I can create an email and have this email go out. I can copy people or blind carbon people on this email. Um, in this case, the email is going out to the person who triggers the rule, the student, and to me, the teacher. Um, we're both going to get a copy of this email message. <coughs> Excuse me. And I, again, I've added in tokens, including a link to the course, so that the student in the email message they get has a link back to the course so that they can go right to the place they need to go to. And the last thing on this I'll point out is that you'll notice I've got this flag dis disabled. Uh, that's a handy way for me to create a set of rules to share out with other people in the system, uh, but not have them running by default. So I can make a rule, have it inside the course template that we use for classes, uh, but leave it disabled so it's not automatically triggering in the background. And then when they go into the course, they can go in, make any changes they want to to that rule, and then enable it just by clicking on this little uh, gear and choosing, oops, not delete, but enable. Aha. Sorry. A little fast on the clicking there. Any questions about this personalized learning designer and, and what, it, what it can do, how it functions? Can I ask a question about uh, plagiarism? Plagiarism? Sure. You bet. Like uh, what kind of plagiarism detectors are available in the system? Correct. Uh, we've got an integration, Turnitin Direct, for the Turnitin uh, set of tools that allow you to, to go straight into Turnitin from here. You can create the, the objects in Turnitin from within Joule. Uh, and have students submit their work and, and do the, the tracking through there. It also integrates with Grademark uh, along with all the rest of their plagiarism tools. Yeah, that's a very solid integration. Do you need to pay extra for those? Uh, not from us, no. We'll just turn that on um, on request. So if you say, we've got turn it in, we want to use it, we'll turn it on. Uh, turn it in has their own fee structure for, for using that, that tool suites, of course. But we don't add anything on top of that. Excellent. <clears throat> any other uh, questions about this sort of functionality or any other functionality pieces you want to see in the system? We do have another question, Andy. I'm not sure whether you know. Were you able to hear that? No. Okay, so the question is, how do you create the uh, content folders? Oh, sure. That's a great question. So these these content folders in the folder view are just um, they're just topic objects. So I can add them uh, just by clicking on a, a little widget here. If I turn on editing, I can just add additional folders to this. I can also create folders of files within my core space if I wanted to have a space where I'm going to add a bunch of files to the class for students to download. And I can do that differently. So I could create a folder and upload all the files in there, or I could just upload a zip file and say, make a file folder object here. 
but this add topic tool would allow me to add an additional topic to the class. So I can just type in the name, hit add topic, and then we'll plop it into the class for me. Does that, that look pretty good? Yes, thank you. You got it. Just to show you the, the file behavior, just like I had the drag and drop with the single file, if I grab a zip file and add that file here, it gives me a little interrogation pop-up first and it says, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to create a folder and unzip this thing and unpack all of the files in it? Do you want me to just create a single file resource where the students would say download a zip file? Uh, or is this a SCORM package, in which case I should create a SCORM object out of it? Uh, and I can manage all of that right through that behavior. Great. Any other functional questions in there that you, you had for me? I've got a list of um, accessibility questions to talk about as well, and, and maybe anything else we really want to dive into that's fine with me. Yeah, if there's no other questions uh, specifically, cool. then, then maybe it's a good idea for us to start the accessibility questions. Is that okay yeah. with you guys? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Are you guys having trouble with that microphone? Yeah, there we go. I, okay. Oh, when you're talking about accessibility, I was hoping that you'd cover how to add extra time for students on certain oh, sure. quizzes and also perhaps taking the exams on different days. And whether that is an exam by exam type of thing or whether it's in it within a student profile, if you know what I'm asking. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you're asking. That's a great question. Um, so quizzes and assignments both have the ability to support um, you know, different rules for different users or groups of users. Uh, we call those overrides. So if I look at this quiz that I've got here just as an example, and again, the, the Dropbox assignments have the same interface and the same options. I have the ability to cre create group or user level overrides and it's it's really attached to the individual items in here so it's not stuck to the student's profile necessarily. It's, it's actually in here. If I did have a group of students that I wanted to apply a specific rule to like this pretty consistently it might be easier to make a group out of those students in the course and then just apply the group rule over and over again for each of the items. Um, but here, let's say group overrides in that example, I have the ability to change the open and close date for this, the, um, the activity. I can change the uh, time that it's available. So um, I can change, in this case, there's a time limit on the quiz. I can set it to a different value just for students in this particular group. Um, and I can, uh, I can alter the window of time that they get to engage in the content. So it does give me a lot of flexibility in there. Um, one other note in there is that I could also change the number of attempts allowed. So I could give one student or a group of students an extra attempt at the quiz um, in order to accommodate some, some problem that they've had. Uh, there are probably better, I'd say more elegant ways to handle students that have the need to have a second try at a quiz than give them extra attempts. but. If that is the right fit for you, then you can definitely do it in this interface. Does that feel pretty satisfactory? Uh, yes, it, yes, it, that, that's fine, thanks. Okay. Great, great, yeah, you bet. Um, to add to that, is that something that the instructors would have to go in and do? Or is that something that like our outreach programs or IT would go in and do? Uh, either group could, so as long as they have the ability to access the course and set up this edit, they could definitely handle, you know, say IT could come in or an outreach if they had the right permissions and the system could come in and do that as well, yeah. And definitely. that would be that would be tied to a specific activity um, yes. as opposed to a specific user, so that for each activity that a group of users might need um, additional time or some kind of accommodation that that change would need to be made. Exactly. 
And of course, once you've set that up, if you copy the course from then on, it, it will copy those rules and then you can just modify who the rule applies to. Again, that's kind of where that idea of using the group comes in pretty handy, is that if I attach the rule to a group, uh, I just have to change who's in the group to change who gets access to the rule over and over again. Excellent. Any other um, specific questions on those? Let's jump in with some of the screen reader and other accessibility items, if not. <clears throat> and I know we sent some text responses to some of the accessibility questions. I'm just going to walk through kind of where we're at um, with all those. Um, uh, JAWS and other screen reader tools are all fully supported in the system. They've been the system's been tested against them. Um, we, uh, as far as we know, we we've either addressed or made a, a ticket out of any open issues with any accessibility items in the system. Uh, and of course, uh, I'll be honest, having worked in software for a very long time. Um, you know, there's always a new thing that will come up, um, which is great in my opinion, uh, because it means that people are using the system, finding new issues, or something that got added that didn't quite work right, um, or some new advance in what what can be done with the screen reading software, for example, uh, that opens up some new things that need to get fixed. And our attitude about it is that it's never really done. Um, it's not something that you check off and go, yeah, we've satisfied screen readers. Let's not think about it again for the next five years. Um, it's something that we pay attention to constantly. Uh, so we're always adding new requests for feature enhancement and functionality behind all of that, um, and we're releasing changes constantly to improve all of that. Uh, by and large, the system is highly accessible. Um, screen readers and keystroke uh, interaction as opposed to mouse interaction all work I think quite nominally in the system. There are a few corner spots where things don't work out as best they could, and so we we attempt to address those either ourselves or in con conjunction with core Moodle. Because we're built on open source Moodle, we, we tend to have to work with open source Moodle's uh, development team to make sure that any changes that we want to affect will work with what they're doing or that we run into something that needs to be addressed in their code base. Um, and oftentimes we give them the fix. Uh, so we say, hey, you know, this needs to be fixed and here's what needs to be changed to fix it. Uh, and then we just need them to release that fix back to us to make it formal. Um, what's nice about us maintaining our own code base though is that then we, we can apply that fix on our own build and wait instead of having to wait on core to release it out. Um, I think some examples of areas where the screen reader uh, or the um, the keyboard only interactions can run into some some complications that have been addressed in the past are uh, you know adding the names of objects on the page. So when we're in our advanced forums tool, for example, um, when it says in the nested li listing there. Um, you know, do you want to open this? It doesn't say just do you want to open this. It says do you want to open this thread named this thread name, so that you know what object on the page it's referring to when it starts reading off that that action item. Likewise, uh, you know, if you turn on editing traditionally in Moodle, um, when you turn on editing, icons sort of spring forth all over the page. Um, which visually is unappealing, um, but for a screen reader now, you know, all of these are hidden, so the screen reader actually has an override that knows that all of these are there and then begins to read them off, and instead of just saying, in this case, update or edit uh, to the user, it says edit this label named getting started, uh, edit the news and announcements forum, uh, so that it, it includes all the appropriate information to make this a really useful interaction for a user. Uh, this 
the behavior does support skipping and logical flow, so it moves down the center content column uh, and then allows you to skip over content to the different headings. Uh, headings are traditionally used for that behavior in all of the, the reading uh, software out there, so that's what everyone's kind of settled on. So it starts with heading ones, allows you to jump to heading twos and across everything to the next heading two, or dive deeper into what's inside of that heading two and see what's in the heading three and the heading four, and so on. Uh, and so again, our our enhancements and our plans, for example, again the the advanced forum, which is a tool that we added to the build, it uses that approach in the way that it lays out and defines the content on the page so that it's as, as easy to use as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, alt text is really important and you'll notice that all of the icons that are built into the page and all the items that are built into the page contain alt text. Uh, if I go in to add content to the page, let's say I'm going to edit this um, getting started label. Oh, go ahead. Do you have a question? Uh, go ahead. I'll wait till you okay. switch subjects. If, if I'm going to add content here, say you notice that I've got an image here in this piece. Um, let's say I want to add another image. I'm going to hit this insert image tool. Um, if I grab an image file and I'm just going to grab something from my recent uploads. Oh, that's right. I don't have any recent uploads because I'm not me. I'm my teacher. Let me grab a file um, really quickly here. Doo, 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 doo. Let's just grab that file. Let's say we're going to add that to this page. Um, you'll notice that it it um, it gives me best practice behavior prompts. So I say insert. It says, you know, you didn't add a description here. Without a description, somebody using a screen reader can't tell what this thing is. Um, you should add a description. Of course, it falls short of forcing me to add a good description to this, but at least it it prompts me and says, you know, is this really the best decision that you can make? Um, eh, you know, it tries to strike a really good balance, I think, between ease of use and appropriate use. Go ahead with your question. Um. For students that might have a vision impairment, can you can they go in like on their class side of it and change the backgrounds or the so it's like black background with yellow text or is that something that like the computer override can do if that's what they have their computer set to? How does that work? Yeah, so if I use my browser overrides um, or computer overrides to do that, that works fine. Um, perfectly, it works the way that you would expect it to work. Um, I could. By default, our themes don't do that right now, and that's something that we've talked about adding to some of the theme packages. But it's something that could be done in a the theme is to allow you to have a button, you know, a, like a toolbar button up here that lets me select the font size, and a toolbar button up here that lets me flip colors, for example. Um, all of that behavior is perfectly acceptable in the tool. It's just not um, presented out of the box at you, if if you understand what I mean. Would that behavior then persist uh, regardless of where the user is logging in? So if they log in at a friend's computer, is that is are they going to get the same look and feel? Yeah, and you know, and that's something that's really great about what Moodle does there is it keeps that session data in the database. So for example, just like when I logged into the class and went into the folder and said, you know, the next time I log in, it'll take me back to that folder in that class when I click on the class, um, that persists across machines. It's not session based in my browser cookies, it's session based on the server. Um, and so same the same approach would be true there. That information would be cached on the server session information for the user and so when they come back next they would get that same behavior back. Yeah. I have one more question. Sure. Do you with Moodle Rooms, can they do, can instructors do like live feeds for lectures or video streaming? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so it, we don't have a tool built in there for a live video feed, but we've got integrations with tools that prevent, present live video feeds like Collaborate or the Kaltura tools. Um, all of those allow you to do that video handling. Um, 
uh, collaborate I know is kind of an easy one to, to show and talk about it does the the live classroom uh, and I can set up all of the my live classroom behavior I would want and save the session after it records and all that um, Kaltura offers a, a pared down set of functionality but it's you know at a different price point um, to, to allow you to kind of see the same sort of behavior. So I can have live streaming video conferences, I can do video sessions with whiteboarding now, um, so that it's got a, a, a pretty good classroom feel to it as well. Do you know if those have available to where you could pull up a screen so an interpreter could interpret that to a deaf student, or a live um, transcription box? You know, I know that Kaltura has talked about live transcriptions for years um, as like some something they were going to bring to the table, and they've never managed to really pull it off. Um, I know that the moderation behavior inside of Collaborate would allow you to support that, so that you could have someone sending a message to someone else so they could read what's being said. Um, and I'm not positive about Kaltura and what they could offer in that, yeah. We'd have to take a look at that. I think I think that we don't have any more questions at the moment. And okay. If you wanna... Great. Run down the list some more. Um, let's see. I uh, and I'll be honest. I, I'm not really sticking to every single question on the, the list because we did provide some written responses as well. But I just want to kind of buzz through them um, without kind of making people pass out. Hopefully, <laughs> the. Um, uh, you know, frames can be used in the system. They are not used by default. You need to actively choose. For example, I want to open a external resource URL in a frame in the page. Um, frames are universally frowned upon in general uh, in HTML. So, you know, we're we're on that bang bandwagon as well. Um, kind of along the same lines, the only element in the system that's Java. Uh, is that drag math HTML editor where you drag um, elements to create uh, mathematical expressions. Uh, everything else does not use Java in the system. That's the only plugin that does um, because again that's it complicates this whole layer of, of conversation around accessibility as well as just ease of use. Um, it, it definitely it's good to, to rely less on Java than more in that, that viewpoint. Um, Text-only approaches and, um, and the ability to engage in pages without style sheets, perfectly acceptable. Um, the system has themes available also that you can use for what we call legacy devices so that, you know, devices that have some style sheet behavior but not modern style sheet behavior can be supported with their own choice of theme that that doesn't use modern style sheets but in fact uses older style sheets as well um, that that gets a little messy though and frankly i I think it's it's great to know that the system also if I rip out all of the style sheets, everything content wise is still presented on the page, and I can still navigate through that content without being buried in the style sheet itself. Um, things that break down in those kinds of approaches are pretty rare and narrow cases. Um, typically they're heavily reliant on things like Ajax that aren't tied to style sheets so much, but usually if the device doesn't support style sheets, it will also have issues with some Ajax functionality. Uh, and that's tied around things like drag and drop, let's say. Like uh, if I want to drag a content item around a class and put it in a different location in a course, that requires some Ajax. <clears throat> but there is a non-Ajax version of how to interact with moving content that works 
perfectly well without style sheets or mouses. Okay, Andy, I think what we'll do, we're, we're really close to our 5 o'clock here, and I want to make sure everybody has a chance for questions. Um, and then also, uh, I'm tell everybody in the room, I put the address, which is barely legible, which is what, now you know why I type all the time. Um, on the board, if you can please do the right evaluations, that would be fantastic. Uh, I forgot the paper ones, so you're just going to have to go there. Um, and also, any other questions that you want to ask these guys, also, you can send an email. If you have questions, get back to your office or tomorrow or in another session. You're like, oh, what I wonder about, send an email. Please send an email to myself or Larry or Meg or Jen, and we will pass those questions on. Um, Andy, we also, you said you responded in writing to some of the questions, and we actually don't think we have that. Um, oh, okay. If you could send that to us, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I'll make sure that gets out to you. Questions or comments on this at all? Is there, before, we'll let these guys do a little wrap-up if we, anybody yeah. else? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, and if you have anything else you want to say or anything, that, that would be great. Otherwise, we think we're pretty much done. You bet. Thank you. Um, and it, you know what? It, if I start babbling and the, someone has a question, feel free to cut me off. <laughs> Just the last little highlights of functionality I'm going to point out here from ease of use perspective. I have a calendar that I've added to my course here. I can add it to different places like my, 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 my Moodle page. Wow, that was an awkward phrasing. Um, the calendar is an internal system that's really handy. It allows me to publish events into it. And then, of course, if I make an assignment or an activity that has a fixed due date, um, for example, April 24th for this homework assignment, um, it will automatically publish itself to the calendar f on my behalf. I don't need to do anything extra other than say, I want this homework assignment to be due on the 24th. Pow, it puts itself in the calendar. Every student in the class sees that on their calendars. So if I open up my student view again, I can see that. If I look at the calendar on the home page as a student, I see a roll-up of all of my courses. If I look at the calendar inside of a course, I see a roll-up of all of my courses. So I, it's not, I'm never going to be blinded by being inside of a class and not knowing that I've got something else due in a different class. It's all presented there for me all the time, which is really handy. Um, I can create my own personal calendar items as well as course specific or group specific calendar items if I'm a teacher. Go ahead. I was just going to ask if the uh, calendar is, is there any way to pull that to a personal calendar off, you know, out of the system or? I can export the calendar in iCal format and import it into, you know, like Outlook or something like that. So I, there's not a, a connector that would do it automatically in the background, but I can always grab that file and bring it over. Thanks. Thank you. Since we're here on the front page, I'm going to just take another quick look over here. There's a little tool that I've got up. I'm not sure if you're using Google Apps for Education, but we do have an integration with that, that tool. We wrote that uh, quite a few years back. Uh, that just gives me single sign-on access to the various spaces in Google Apps, as well as a quick view of my Gmail. Um, I've got to refresh my token here to, to uh, see the listing here in the block. Um, and I'll, I'll, I won't waste time doing that right now, but that is a, a really handy integration and a nice piece as well. So it gives me access to some really easy, easy pieces of the system. Um, I think that's pretty much all I really wanted to cover. I could definitely dive into any specific activities or elements or you know favorite tools if anybody's got any, or I can uh, I can say thanks and good night. We've got one more question here. Excellent. I hope this is a quick calendar question. Um, can students add events to, to the calendar, or does it just come from instructors? They sure can. If they wanted to add a reminder about something. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I can put in my dentist appointment a reminder or, you know, pizza party on my own calendar uh, that's visible to me. And then the faculty member sort of has the greater scope of powers to be able to push down on other people's calendars. Yeah, perfect. So how does this, are they, and are the calendar events color-coded by course or anything to differentiate them? Uh, they're color-coded by class of event, 
so group events and user created events and global events are different colors than course level events but all course events show up in the same color and if I have multiple assignments due from different courses here it actually breaks them out in a list where I can see markers between them that tell me which ones in which course and if I click on this link it actually takes me to a like a longer view where I can see which course is supplying which event to my calendar is that yeah great feel like you, yeah thanks excellent. I think we have one more over here. Hi, I'm sorry if I missed this before, but I have a question about enrolling TAs and bringing in guests into courses. Uh, if one, is that possible? Two, who or at what level is that permission uh, set or available? The great questions. Um, so you've got a couple of different options and I'll, I'll just go for the easy option first which is for guests there there's the ability to turn on a guest user for the system that allows anyone that shows up on the site to say I'd like to just be in the system as guest um, and then you could open up a course to allow guests to enter the course you could also tune within the course what guests can see and what they can't see based on the different permissions for different objects in the course uh, likewise for TAs, you could say, I, I want a TA in this class. S teachers could be given that power to assign that role in the course, uh, or they might not. It, it really depends on how institutionally you want to handle it. Uh, by default, a teacher could do that. Um, so it's, it's not like it, the system would be freaking out if you did get that power. It's actually built to allow that. Um, but it's really easy to turn that power off also. Uh, and then that would allow you to be able to say, I'm going to make this person who has an account on the site somewhere my TA for this course. Um, typically, institutions like to drive that from the back end because they like to track it, but not always because, frankly, that's a lot of extra information that somebody has to record in the student information system that maybe they don't care to, to know. So, and so it's good to be able to turn the keys over to you and it, it's really easy to do that. Um, you could also go into a process for guests to allow guests to be given their own personal account to log in as and you could make them a not a student but not not a student, uh, you know, if that makes any sense. Um, so I could create a role for them that has limited access to the system um, but it still has access to my course. Typically though, guest is an easy way to go because then nobody has to make an account for them uh, and guest comes built in with really strong restrictions like I don't get to post in forums, I don't get to look at grades, I don't get to do things that guests shouldn't do. Does that feel uh, like a pretty good answer? Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Yeah. Anytime. Great. Any other questions? <laughs> Excellent. Well, and again, uh, we're happy to answer any questions that come via email. Um, it's no problem at all. Yeah, and yes, Jen, I will send you the uh, the responses to those questions in in a uh, Word doc here shortly. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Andy and whoever else you've got there. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. We appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, Andy, we'll just, uh, we're, I'm just going to shut down, and then we'll send you follow-up questions as we have them. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll let you know where we can get the recording as well. Oh, uh, right. Yes, we need that, too. I'll, thank you. I'll probably post-process it into like a YouTube video so that you can just give people a link um, unless you prefer the file. No, uh, no, just please just give us a link. Yeah. The link is perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.